Good morning. How are we doing? Can we kill these lights again so that we can see my beautiful slides? I started, I have a method of preparing slides and um, it involves post-it notes and stuff like that. And because half of my slide is actually Instagrams, so, um, but there's no coffee Instagrams, um, so never mind. Um, the title of this talk, um, I've been told, is one of the most interesting at ScaleConf. Um, so hopefully this talk may partly live up to the title. Um, but it comes from a, a song uh, by a guy called C6 Steve. And um, C6 Steve's quite a, a big influence for me. Um, he's an awesome guy. Um, he's about 70 now, and um, he didn't become famous until like 2007. Um, before that, he was, he was a bit of a hobo. Um, in fact, he's got a great quote, and now I've lost my phone. Oh, there it is, okay. Um, he's got a great quote, and I think it's actually probably relevant to developers as well. And so I'll just read it. Um, I only rediscovered it this morning. He said, hobos are people who move around looking for work. Tramps are people who move around and don't look for work. And bums are people who don't move and don't work. And I've been all three. And um, I think probably in this audience today, we have hobos, tramps, and bums from a developer standpoint. And I, I'm, I kind of, my, all my talk to kind of maybe inspire you, if you're a bum, um, to become a hobo or a tramp. And um, we'll see. So. This talk comes with a warning, um, firstly. Um, it does contain some strong opinions, um, and they're mostly mine, um, not other people's. So if there's stuff in it that you hate, then you can hate me. And, and that is the awkward part of being a heckler, is it kind of opens you up to being heckled. So this is probably the most heckler-friendly talk of the conference. Um, yeah, so I'm Mike Jones. You'll find me online as... I'm sick of maps. I don't hate maps. I love maps. I have a three meter map in my front room. Um, it's maps is spam backwards. So um, it makes a lot of sense to most people. But this talk is really about, it's about my life. Um, it's about my screw ups, um, my perception of when something is a win and when it's a failure, and my perception of, of what things are, are good and bad. And so this talk is a very personal talk for me. And um, that means you can heckle too, because the best thing about personal opinions, strong opinions especially, is generally like 50% of this room will probably think that I suck. But that's okay, because 50% of the people think you suck. So um, it's, it's, it's cool, we can, we can all get along. And this is, this is the embarrassing tweet. When I was, thankfully Twitter's now opened up our archive. I've been on Twitter since it was Twitter, and um, it didn't have any vowels. Thankfully, they added them back. And I've now got access to my archive of all of the stupid things I've said ever since it started. And this was the stupid thing I said at last year's ScaleConf. And um, I'm embarrassed slightly, but also it was true. Um, so, um, so, but the 5% thought it was awesome. So maybe it wasn't 50-50, but last, last year it was, and somebody retweeted it. And I have no idea if that's, if that's you. Thank you. Um, I, was, I felt good for a, for a short moment. There was a little burst of whatever that drug is um, that validated me. Um, so the, the thing is, though, that if you're sitting there today thinking, looking at all the speakers and thinking, they're, they're on stage. Wow, they must have succeeded at something. I'm here because I've, I'm a serial failure. And, and so it's more a case of, Actually, sometimes we set perceptions up in our mind that, that the only people that are allowed to talk about stuff is the people that have scaled to, what was it, something terabyte of data per half hour that Facebook was talking about, or the, to go 800 logins a second, which generates X. Like, just because that's not your story doesn't mean it's not a story um, that's worth telling. And so I was sitting there, was it 14, 15 months ago now, at the last GalConf, and I was, I'd previously started companies, which I'll, I'll talk about before, but I was in a corporate job, and I'd been in that job for four years, and I was, I don't do, I'm not a good corporate citizen, and um, I was itching to leave, and I was itching to do something else, so maybe that's why I was so angry, maybe that's why my tweets were so angry. Um, 
but I guess if you're sitting here today as somebody who's stuck in a corporate job in nine to five, kind of you just do your thing, you're, you're itching to, to do something, maybe in 14 months time, in, instead of heckling and sending rude tweets, you could be on stage talking about how you've started something and completely failed. And for me, that's the first thing that I wanted to talk about, which is a failure to start is a greater failure than anything else. Um, and that's an opinion that I have. And you might be sitting there thinking, I just, I can't bring myself to, to deal with the, the pressure from family, from parents, from friends, etc., about how I'm going to explain if this idea I have, this thing I want to execute, is actually, um, it t doesn't turn out to be true. This proposition I have is actually, nobody cares. And the, for me, the failure to take the bold step, to do the, the brave thing, and find out if nobody cares about what you do, is actually so much more um, interesting and, and valuable um, than, than doing that. So, yeah, everything that you see in this talk really comes from, from that perspective of believing that, that starting is, is much more important than, than, than winning. Um, and on that, sort of, on that note, really, um, the way I've been thinking about my life is that there's been many different versions of Mike Jones ever since the, 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 I started my career, I guess you can call it a career. Maybe it's more a career like the other kind of career, um, um, from one thing to another. Um, but it's this, I, th I kind of, maybe I think of myself as like software. If you track software over its lifetime, it has versions and it has, it has features and, and it does things. And, and that's so, I guess I kind of see my, my life as a series of versions, starting with version one where I was well into um, uh, Macromedia Director, which allowed you to make CD-ROMs. CD-ROMs were cool. Um, they weren't just great coffee coasters, which is what they seem to be these days. Um, and really for me, like I got started because I, was, I loved um, taking photos and I loved doing art and the way to sort of do slideshows and make uh, things animate at the time was with Macromedia Director. So I spent uh, 900 pounds, which is uh, need 10,000 rand I guess these days, um, on Macromedia Director and taught myself how to do tweening and wonderful words like that. But for me, it, it, being able to take a whole bunch of images and turn them into something that, that amused people or just let them waste five minutes of their life, was, 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 it was awesome and it was fun. And I have never become a great animator or I've never become like some Oscar-winning multimedia guru, but I now know enough about that world that I can use the word tween, and most of you have probably got blank faces, but if you're into that world, you know, he knows what he's talking about. He said tween, which is, it's the in-between. Ah, it's clever, isn't it? But it's a world that I now know a little bit about, enough to have a semi-intelligent conversation with, with an animator, and, and I think if you track through um, my life, I've done a lot of little things. I've never become a master of any of them. But it's, it's enabled me to, to take on enough information um, to be able to have intelligent conversations. <laughs> I feel it like it's intelligent. <laughs> maybe, maybe they perceive it slightly differently. But have a conversation at least and not have a fear of being embarrassed when talking to other people. And I think sometimes especially um especially developers where where you have often like a binary mindset of like i'm uh, something I'm, I'm either great at something or i'm i don't know anything about it um there's a fear over becoming knowing a little bit about things and and kind of seeing where that journey takes you and especially when it comes to starting a company or starting a project um you feel like you don't um you don't you can't see the the end game and you can't see how you're going to get there because you don't have the skills so therefore you stand back and, and, and don't start and I think being comfortable with not knowing how something is going to end is a skill that actually you can develop it takes you but you have to try doing it first before you know whether you can you can do it and so 
one of the things that I, I'm very passionate about is that you create a learning path for yourself where you can be stretched and where you can discover things that you don't know um, so that you can, you can have um, awesome failures like I did. Like, look at this one, version 6, mobile application developer, 2004. That one, we ended up homeless as a family over that one. Um, <laughs> so it's, it's one of the key lessons for me in, in learning in, in becoming a willing to take risks is if you do have a significant other, you have a relationship with a man or a woman that you care about, um, make sure they're in because you may end up making them homeless and um, all buy a camper van. That's my other recommendation because then you've always got a home and, um, and, and you'll never be homeless. <laughs> Actually, that job there, the sales specialist, the first bonus I got, I bought a camper van. I didn't really, I didn't really analyze it till afterwards. I think it's like a security blanket, like a two-year-old has. Um, but I had to sell it, shame. Um, which funded the next thing. There you go. Um, but it's, 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 sometimes there's, um, the other thing that I wanted to point out with the mobile applications developer thing is we were, the ideas we had were, were wonderful and crazy, but the timing stunk. 2004, we were working on Windows Mobile version 1, and you should, is the Microsoft guy still here, never use anything Microsoft version 1, because it just will never. <laughs> um, but Microsoft version 3 and 4 stuff is, is often very useful, and uh, they're wonderful sponsors of Scalecom. <laughs> So, um, actually, the, the things like when I was a collaboration consultant, or I deployed Microsoft software for a living, Life Communication Server, or Link as it's now called. And so there's, there's, there's things that you learn on your journey that, that become increasingly valuable to you um, later on, but you just can't see it when you're, when you're head down. And it's, it's just trying to extract that knowledge out. And, I think that maybe the last thing that I would point out on, on this slide is, is like version 10 of me now is Mike as the managing director of Western Cape Labs. And um, we don't make drugs. I got an email the other day from somebody who wants to become an intern at my laboratory. Um, <laughs> and they said about their medical degree and stuff, we make software and it's gonna be awesome. But when, when you're in that starting mode, um, all of these other things, I was, I was often as part of a small team or running my own team, but this, this when you're in, in the, the, the throes of beginning something, you are, you are everything. There is no, that, at that point, the, the version of you is, is kind of the, that version of the software that you don't really enjoy that much. It's the version that does a little bit of everything badly. Um, I, even at Christmas, I was standing at robots handing out leaflets for, for our new startup. So, like, you've got to be humble and learn to uh, do the things that you'd rather pay somebody else to do. Um, so the next point really is around doing something that matters. And for me, this is what we're doing now. Um, the first product of Western Cape Labs is um, ontheway.co.za. And it's basically the marketplace, and it's, it's delivering locally crafted, locally micro-manufactured products. And, and bringing them to the door. And it's a, it's, it's, it has comparisons to Etsy, except it will never scale, and it will never make anywhere <laughs> where near as much money or, or bring as, touch as many people's lives as Etsy. But it matters to me, and that's why we started it, was like, uh, sometimes we, we look at these hero companies that we have, like Etsy or Facebook or Microsoft, or, or um, I don't know, I'm not going to list anymore. And those, we sort of look at them and we go, oh, that's, that's something that I want to achieve. I'm going to keep iterating ideas in my mind until I come up with the thing that they came up with. And if you hunt through back through the history, uh, Etsy's a great example, actually. There's a two-hour interview on Pando Monthly um, with the current CEO of Etsy. And he talks about some of the rampant failure that that company had before they became the company they are today. Um, so don't assume in your mind as you're, you're building something, um, but do do something that matters. And like I've, the reason I've picked out these photos, um, these are sellers on our, on our marketplace. And they've all got a story about why they're doing what they're doing. And we're just able to aggregate what they're doing and give them a new audience. Um, 
Like this lady, um, Renee, she makes these these beautiful clothes, but she just did it because she her job doesn't really pay that well at all, and she really wants to um, she wants to be able to impact people through the clothes she makes. And um, you too could own a pair of flowery trousers um, if you and, and I know Bryn. Bryn really wants a pair of flowery trousers. Unfortunately, these are size eight. Um, so unless you have a high waist and uh, skinny hips, uh, these ones aren't going to fit you. But she'll make you some more. And uh, Simon down in the corner, Simon makes these um, breadboards. He's a furniture maker. He makes beautiful furniture that can liven up your house. But he also runs a project where he teaches um, guys who have no uh, a useful skill, um, how to turn wood and how to create beautiful um, charcuterie boards and all that kind of stuff. But then, before, they had no commercial outlet for their stuff. Um, but now, with something like On The Way, they're able to take a skill and actually make money from it. And that's, for, for this economy, that's one of the key things that we can do. Like, you guys are so blessed that you have a skill that you can um, impact people's lives and earn a living from, but there's so many people around us that, that, that aren't able to do that. And so looking for something, to do something that matters, whereby um, you can make raw, that one in the corner, an iPad case made from raw silk. I mean, I couldn't even come up with this stuff. But thankfully, I'm able to write a website which promotes it. And, and if you dig through the history of, um, of where On The Way started, it generally started drinking coffee, tea or beer and and having open conversations with people about like what I wanted to do and things that were annoying me and things that I wanted to solve and and it's it's very funny like talking to um, talking to people uh, about on the way the number of people that have said to me I had that idea like three years ago and or or my brother-in-law has been talking about doing something like that and it's like Cool. Well, we did it, and he's still talking about it. And and but it's so it's like start with the tea and the coffee. And uh, this is always if you want awesome tea, go to Always in Claremont. It's a great great place to go and warm your hands when you're cold. Because if you're a poor a hacker, you get cold, and so then you can't code properly. So tea tea is awesome because you can wrap your hands around the pot and code. And um, but. But the, the whole thing with, with tea and coffee is it's cheap. And people love going for tea and coffee in Cape Town. I've never been to a city where I've had so many coffee meetings. Um, it's, it's the default answer. Should we have a meeting? Yeah, let's do coffee. And it's just people love it here. But they're willing to share um, their knowledge that they've gained over many years over a cup of coffee. And the amount of free consulting I've had over coffee, um, I can see some of the people I've had free consulting from in this room, so hopefully they don't feel manipulated and abused. <laughs> but but they've, I'm sure they've gained something from my intelligent responses. Um, but And also the other thing with, um, this is very focused on Cape Town, and the, there seems to be a massively, there was a better word than inbred, um, insular. <laughs> positive, there you go, community in Cape Town, where there generally is only two degrees of separation between you and the person you want to speak. They talk about like the seven degrees of Kevin Bacon or whatever it is, but actually in Cape Town it's generally two. Uh, there's like, you're talking to somebody, it's like, oh yeah, I know that guy, let me make an introduction. So, so many, so, the, but if you don't say yes to those coffee meetings, then you remain two degrees away and not one degree. Um, so, so take those meetings. Um, the next one is kind of um, scaling yourself um, and, and how you can scale through others. And this really only hit me the other day when I realized that um, I'm, I'm not a perfectionist, but I know what I like. And um, Stacy, one of uh, the, the girls who works with me, she was like, I haven't done X, Y, Z because I know that you're going to have a strong opinion about it. <laughs> and I was like, oh, pants. Like, that's not, this is going to become a barrier to scale. And I've realized that um, what I had to teach her is like, yes, there's like, I still want things to be great, but I, I don't mind if you only do it 80% um, of the way I would do it. Um, if that, that 20%, you need to be comfortable 
that I'm comfortable that you're only doing it 80% of the way I do. Does that make sense? So it's not just that I need to be comfortable, you need to know that I'm comfortable so that you can be comfortable with me being comfortable about it. And, and it, it's, it's that extra step that I didn't realize that I need to communicate to my staff, even if there's only three of us, like that I'm cool with you not doing things the way I would do them. Um, because what, but, but we're definitely not cool with things not being good for the customer, not being good and right. So as it's the, if the way you wiggle to that, to that final end point, I really should be cool with it. Um, the next one is really about um, not scaling out of embarrassment. And um, these are the three offices um, that uh, Western Cape Labs has had in nine months. The first one is at Cobridge, which is awesome. Uh, Cobridge is in Claremont, and it's like a hacker space. If you want to see it, then go to the, there's a hackathon on Sunday at one, uh, one in the afternoon. And it's a shared space where there's a uh, great coffee machine, which is, has Tribe coffee as well. There we go, it's just Tribe all over the place. Um, uh, table tennis, um, there's smart people. Um, there's, um, there's an, a crazy economist there um, who swears a lot and uh, there's just nice people and it doesn't get too cold in winter um, so and always is just around the corner if you do get cold you can go and sit in always which is what I did um, but it's not the it's not the cool space if you're looking for like a really groovy place that like people come into your offices and go oh wow this is awesome then it, that's not what it is but actually it's perfect um, and what I think a failure that a lot of people make when they start something is they try to scale because they're embarrassed about what people will think. They try to get a great office that looks good and has like nice hangings on the wall. They try to involve the most uh, rock star developers because then people will say, oh, your startup is so cool because he works for it. And, and there's a whole bunch of things that we do because we're embarrassed that we're small. But the problem is that that then creates an expectation in people's mind that we are something that we're not. And the great thing that I have now, this is, this is my garage, it's, it's, it's quite long, but it flooded the other day when it rained. And so, like, you can still see the floor's a bit damp. Um, you could, it's kind of a bit damp over here. And I could, not, I could not invite our suppliers to come to our office, our office, which is actually my garage. Um, but there's no need to be ashamed of it because we're just like them. They're working from their living room, from their front room, from their friend's garage, etc. And if I try to sort of sublet a massive workshop or a, or a warehouse, their expectation around service levels, around flexibility would just be so different. I'd have to live up to the expectations that we were part of NASPERS or something, but we're not. We're a garage startup and therefore the expectations that people have are based on that. Um, and this, this whole, this realization around like sometimes we're embarrassed about our startups and we need, um, it came for me, uh, suddenly started thinking about when I was listening to a podcast from a, um, a group that's on bootstrapped FM, bootstrap.fm. And if you're into this kind of stuff, that's a really good podcast. Go back to the beginning. They've not been going that long. Um, but it's started by a guy called, um, Ian Landsman. And um, it's, it's worth listening to, but this just some real key tips around uh, what you should do when you get started. Um, the next one, next point I wanted to talk about was um, about being scalable, but actually not being scaling. And I think somebody has kind of already made this point around the scaling at the right time. And for us, that's meant picking some really rock solid tools like Vagrant, Sentry, Chef, um, building our servers on, on Hetzner and um, Amazon, but yet we don't actually use the full power of any of those. Like you should see my chef recipes, like Jonathan cries probably, he cries himself to sleep at night if he ever would ever see any of them. Um, Sentry, we use the Get Sentry, the hosted version. We don't have our own super configured uh, version of Sentry. Hetzner, I'm using three virtual machines with one gig of RAM each, and they're fine. They survive. Um, all of Chef, I started installing like the full version of Chef and trying to do knife and all kinds of stuff, and 
chef solo is fine. Like, so this whole thing of picking a set of tools which you know because you've done enough research enable you to scale to the nth degree, to, to be able to spin up a thousand virtual machines, deploy all your software and do repeatable uh, recipes and hire a hundred developers and give them a vagrant image on day one. Like, it doesn't actually take a huge amount of time to get started with each of these, but it does when you're nine months into a project and you're trying to back some of these scalable things in. So if you're going to start, start being ready to scale, but pick all of the hosted light virtual versions of everything because it gets you thinking along the right way, but it doesn't actually force you to, to use that. Um, the other one that's not on here um, is, is the 37 Signals products. I don't know if people know, but if you search for 37 Signals um, free, um, it gives you a URL for one of their products, which they still offer for free. But if you then just take the product out and put every one of their other products in, um, <laughs> there's also a free version of all of those. So, so Basecamp, Campfire, um, High Rise, they all have like a version that's free for three people or 10 megabytes or, or something. Um, so that's another, and they, obviously they know it's still there, they just don't publicize it. Um, whoops, <laughs> hello internet. Um, so um, use, use those. Um, we use the uh, high rise for example for contact management and it was free up to 200 contacts. But the time, by the time we've got 200 contacts, it's embedded in our, in our processes. We're, we're getting a lot of value out of it. So I'm totally cool with paying $20 a month or whatever for it. But at the beginning, I'm not extracting much value out of it. So um, yeah, use that, there's some hacks. The next one is like picking your giants wisely. I'm a strong believer that we should stand on the shoulders of giants, but I think it's really important to actually understand who those giants are from a people perspective, not just from a company. And these are the choices that we made, and um, your choices may be completely different. But So we chose um, to build our systems on Python, um, which I didn't know before we started the, com the company, but I met really cool Python developers in Cape Town. And I thought, if I'm going to ask anyone questions, I'd like to ask those guys questions. Whereas the PHP guys I've met, like Darb, I mean, come on, have you met? <laughs> <laughs> Joke. You're my bro, you're my homeboy. He's my fellow populator of the world. Um, and um, the, the, the guys behind that, and he knows Python too. Sorry, Darb, I love you, man. Um, the, the guys behind all of these companies are, are great. If you meet the guys behind um, Basho who create React, they're cool guys, they're helpful guys, um, and they were just stood out as being, um, being capable and smart. And this guy, um, I've forgotten his name, Armin, is it Rocha or something? Um, he came to PyCon and his software is like him. It's weird, it's uncanny, it's smart, it's pragmatic, and it was, I definitely made a great choice. Um, this is a help desk product. Um, Ian, oh, Keynote crashed. Apple makes terrible software, obviously. <laughs> let's, let's bash every, everyone today. There we go. Um, um, Ian and his team made HelpSpot and have recently been building uh, Snappy from scratch. Um, as a, uh, a software as a service, very like Trello, it's a, like a live app version of a help desk software. But like these guys know how to do help desk. I don't, so I've learned that Ian does and the way he does stuff is awesome. And if you sign up for Snappy um, at the moment, you get 25% off for life because it's still in beta. And I've been able to influence the direction of that software. So whatever industry you're gonna go in, look for those key people who are the experts in your area. Um, that you might be able to um, stand on their shoulders and just, just pick your, 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 um, your people correctly um, and wisely. Um, offloading the right stuff at the right time is, I think it's critical for growth, especially when your revenue isn't growing. And if you look at On The Way, for example, 
from a revenue perspective, it's a complete failure at the moment. Like, we're losing so much money every month, it's ridiculous. So I'm having to go contracting to stop us losing money. Um, but we still need to exist. So I need to let go, personally, of certain tasks. Like, yes, I can write tweets, but is it a good idea for me to write tweets every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday and promote our product when I can pay somebody else uh, a thousand rand a month and they can think about that, they can look at my site and generate a bunch of tweets. Actually, it frees up a bit of my mind to do things that are important, like bring in money. Um, and yes, yeah, that's very important. But that doesn't mean that we, um, we need to sort of cup our arms around everything. Like so many of you guys and ladies, when I say guys, I mean ladies as well, um, are very capable of doing so many different things. You're capable of back-end development, front-end development. You're capable of writing. Um, maybe you're capable of Photoshop, if you're really cool. And, um, but that doesn't mean you should do everything. So find the right things to offload. Um, the things that we did that sort of enabled us to cut a whole bunch of corners was things like the legal stuff. Um, we found a, a local law firm that is happy to validate legal terms and conditions. So as far as I'm aware, it's not illegal to steal other people's terms and conditions. Um, so uh, take, like, take ours. If you're going to start a marketplace, go and look at our terms and conditions, steal them, and then make sure that you've edited our name out of them because I don't want to be <laughs> liable for your, your site. Um, but then get a lawyer to validate them. They'll only charge you for like four hours worth of work instead of four weeks worth of work to write the terms and conditions from scratch. Um, from an accounting perspective, like we found uh, an accountant that used a software as a service package for accounting and it turns out that the people in the accounting world that are smart enough to know that that's the future are also the kind of guys that you want to work with. So like try and find little hacks that help you know where to offload um, the right thing at the right time. And also where to bring in experts that have strong opinions about stuff that, that maybe you don't have them. Um, so for example, we used Flow, um, Rian's here somewhere. Um, we, we, gave, we did a short workshop with them that generated a, a, a few pieces of paper that we have on our wall. And when we internally have an argument about something, we're able to go to the, 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 the piece of research that we did with Flow that says what we're going to do, and we go back to that. And it's important, that was important for us because it's, it's a way of us all being on the same page. And if you've never started a company with friends, um, then you won't have faced this. But if you have, you'll know what I'm talking about. Because the, when you start a company with friends, you're much more open to having a fight about things, which is great um, because it enables honest conversations. But it also means you're totally willing to sort of go over here and agree that that's a great thing and then go over here and that's a great thing. You'll go to the pub and you'll both get drunk and suddenly you're starting a conference called ScaleConf. And it's a, <laughs> and so, um, the, so the, there's all kinds of things that can happen, but doing something like the work we did with Flow, which was probably only two days worth of work, is, is vital to be giving you a, a, a straight line on which you can zigzag around and pull back to. So know when to use other experts. And the last thing I want to talk about is creating your own education path. And um, an education will not teach you not to put signs like that up at Cape Town International Airport. This is the steepest steps there are at Cape Town International, and there's a sign on them that says, no trolleys. Um, and I don't know why somebody's education led them to believe that a no trolley sign, you, you'd need a bunch of very strong rugby players to get anything up those stairs. Um, but this whole, whole idea of if, if the education system that we have globally, it's not just South Africa, is not going to give you the skills that you need to be able to navigate this kind of problem, this problem of creating something from scratch, of, of being, um, being a potential winner or a potential failure in any one environment. And um, so for me, when I was stuck in my corporate job again, which was the start of this conversation that, I, that led me to being an angry person heckling at ScaleConf, 
I, I was already on an education path to learning the things that I needed to know about the South African startup world, re-enabling bits of my mind that I needed to reawaken if, if I was going to go from being a sales and marketing guy to back to being a developer. Like my skills were out of date because I'd taken a four year break from, from the industry. Like I had to recreate an education path for myself. And so I think that's my challenge to you guys today is think about what the things that, the gaps in your knowledge that you have, join an open source project or find a, a local startup that has a, a little bit of money that will enable you to be, sort of bridge that gap to maybe doing your own thing or becoming, uh, what's the word they use, it? like entrepreneur, somebody who's an entrepreneur in a company. That's, that's a bit of a douchey marketing term, I think. Um, but, but building an education path for, for you to becoming something that you can see other people doing that, that appeals to you. And nobody is going to create that path for you. The only person that's going to give you a true understanding of what it needs for you to be bold and say, I'm willing to fail, I'm willing to, to step out and become um, a developer who creates something that matters, um, then I think that requires you taking ownership of, of creating an education path for yourself and filling in those gaps. And so that's all. And I'd just like to, um, and there's a crazy offer, um, but every order on, on the way um, that mentions ScaleConf um, will give you a free punch dance dot gif. Um, it's, it's from me to you. And uh, I'm happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Mike. I'd just like to say that even though he heckled at my conference, he's now a very good friend of mine, and I was the first person to buy it on the way. So. Yes. Questions? Um, as someone who has been the first customer in Cavendish because I needed a jersey and a coat before going to work, I, can I ask you, have you ever been in Codebridge during the winter? I have, yes. And I don't know how you can say it's not cold. <laughs> Well, I'd give you a trick. If you go back a few photos, that white thing there came with me to Combridge. It's a little gas fire. You can do it for about half an hour before you start to gas yourself out, um, but, uh, but it does work. <laughs> Remember, decent, decent questions are in the running for coffee. Three kilograms worth of coffee. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm asking. Um, <laughs> I just have to ask if you would uh, choose personally, uh, would you rather fight 10 duck sized horses or one horse sized duck? You're a terrible person, Ben. <laughs> but we do need an answer. <laughs> I'd, I'm, blown, I'm blown away. Um, I'd rather fight three small children. <laughs> Or a unicorn. <laughs> Unicorns are amazing. Um, having done all the things you've done over the last few years to get where you are now, what would you say is your, was your greatest fear or obstacle to getting where you are? I think my greatest fear was, was making my family homeless again. Um, and like running out of money or wasting other people's money um, is a, is always keeps me awake at night. Um, and it's not to say don't take money, because that's one of the things I, I didn't talk about was well, On The Way was funded firstly by my voluntary retrenchment for three months, and then we were back to zero, and then I took a small amount of, um, of angel funding, and I'm, I'm grateful to them to give me the opportunity, but that fear of, of taking, uh, taking somebody's hard-earned money and making decisions on a daily basis to maybe spend an, an hour and a half on Facebook instead of actually writing some code um, as being a complete waste of somebody else's time and money. Um, I think that fear of letting other people down is, is always at the back of your head. And it's not to say that you can ever turn that off, um, but you need to be able to, to live with it. No, no. <laughs> Put the hi, mic down. Hi, Mike. Hi, I'm Brad. Um, why you gotta get all up in my grill? 
Um, do, do, you, do I need to defend myself? <laughs> no. <laughs> Hey Mike, um, so I know uh, you have a family. Um, usually startups are often more headed up by single guys with a lot of time at night. Um, what advice do you have for people who do also have a family who would be interested in starting a, a startup? Just like three practical things. Yeah, good question. Um, one, they talk about ramen noodle startups like Paul Graham. Kids love noodles. Um, so um, actually, it's um, it's not that far off. Um, so you can you can teach your kids to like food that that's cheap. Um, <laughs> the other one, I think, the biggest thing though is is I kind of touched on it before, which is um, don't be afraid to 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 raise money um, because for me. The creation and the doing of a, of a startup, creating, taking an idea and executing it, um, is, far more, um, is far more important than whether I gave away control. And when the older you become, the more money you need. Um, for like my kids' schooling cost me like 4,000 rand a month or something. I've got three kids and another one on the way. And those, like, those costs will never go away. You, well, I suppose I could homeschool them. <laughs> I, then I couldn't be a startup. Um, but so being willing to to take on um, uh, to take on finance in order to to see those dreams. But the other one is not being afraid of of your knowledge that you've gained by being old and sort of diminishing the value of that skill. I can see there's plenty of people in this room that are older and wiser than me. And sometimes we we kind of as old dudes, um, I know I don't look that old. Um, we we have a lot to offer, and we we diminish that skill, that skill, and that knowledge, and that wisdom by by trying to defend ourselves against young upstarts that have no skill but a lot of time. And so, being confident in not no skill—that's really judgmental. Um, <laughs> being being confident in the skills that you have, and the knowledge, and the wisdom, and the ability to see things that that young people don't see, and um, there'd probably be a few things. It's the React ambassador. Ambassador, hello. How's it, Mike? Hello. Um, you're, you mentioned you've got a partner. Does he code as well? Uh, I don't have a partner. I have two staff who work for me. Um, one of them's a front-end developer. The other one is our uh, seller manager. Um, so um, I don't have a, a partner in the true sense of a partner, somebody who is um, as equally in the business as me. Um, Cool. Um, so your front-end dev, um, do you set clear parameters for what he must do and do you have any, you, know, you mentioned like how you resolve um, sort of differences of opinion of how to develop stuff. Um, well, I've had some experience in the past where, uh, you know, meetings can go on forever because you disagree on how to implement things. So I'm just wondering how you handle that kind of thing. Yeah, well firstly, she's a she, not a he. So let's uh, big up for the ladies. Um, she, uh, she, she's quite comfortable with being directed. That's one thing. She knows that I am the founder, the opinionated one. And um, the, we, that doesn't mean that she, she can't bring an opinion. It's just that what we've done is we've picked a few things. Um, one of the giants that we stood on um, is, uh, is a bootstrap. So our entire the, uh, on the way .co.za site is built on Bootstrap. Most people can't tell, except if you actually look at the source code, um, because you can do a lot with that. But again, that kind of sorted a whole load of problems of, of do we make it responsive or not responsive? Do we use this feature of jQuery or not? Was we just kind of fixed and said, OK, we're going to keep it simple. We're going to use Bootstrap, or we're going to make it look nice. And um, so that's what, what we did. So generally, we have one meeting a week. Um, Monday morning, um, we get together 
Um, we're all Christians in the company, so we all pray together, which helps the code. And uh, then, then we talk for 45 minutes, we go through Trello, order the stories, order the priorities, and then we get on with it. Um, it yeah, we, I'm not a fan of meetings. All right, thank you very much, Mike. Cool, thanks, guys.